Welcome to the uh, Back to Basics School of Ministry online Bible study. And uh, tonight we're looking at Lesson 6 of our course, Old Testament Books of History, Part 2. And tonight we're looking at one of my favorite characters of Scripture. I know I say this about everybody, but one of my favorite characters in Scripture, Nehemiah. 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 Okay, one of my favorites. Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, we are one half the way through the course already. We are halfway through this course. And six more weeks, and then you can get a break for the rest of the summer. Karen, I know you need a rest, and a lot of your work, you work so hard. You're pumping out those homework assignments. And uh, so for, on July 22nd, we should be getting uh, completion on this particular course. Then we can rest until September. But you all are doing a great job, and it's, it's uh, wonderful what you're doing. I thank God for you. And um, it's just a blessing to be in this, this kind of ministry and to know you guys. Okay. All right. So we're recording and um, waiting on some other people. We're not going to wait on others to come on. When they come on, they come on. But uh, the recording will be ready. You'll have it by tomorrow um, for review. And those who cannot come on live, they will have the recording. Praise God. Karen's back to work. And uh, Karen just got home and rushed to come to class. Man, uh, uh, that's something. Karen rushed to get to class. Okay. So we don't want to overload you, over overwork you guys. Praise God. I see Dr. Jean Bratton is on. And we were talking about you earlier, Dr. Jean Bratton. Bratton one of our scouts for our land, helping us find property. Dr. Gene Bratton said, yeah, I'm going to help find me some, pro find some property because I want a Minnesota cabin. Right that, I, wanna, I want my cabin there. Sister Loretta's on. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank God. Okay, let's take a look at um, our lineup, our schedule of chapters. There are 13 chapters in Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is the, the, the man who led the third and final wave of Jews out of Babylon, out, out of the Babylonian captivity. Nehemiah, he's the leader of the third wave of Jewish captives. And many of these coming out with him are the sons and daughters of the original captives. You remember that Israel went into captivity for 70 years because they sinned against God. They continued to sin. They continued to do their own thing. Even the priests were corrupt. The government was corrupt. The people were corrupt. They just turned their backs on God. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot emphasize or overemphasize the importance of studying Scripture and teaching others. We see so many similarities between 8th century BC Israel when Judah went in when Israel went into captivity and 6th century BC Israel when Judah went into captivity so many similarities be between Israel and the United States of America ladies and gentlemen uh, Israel went into judgment they went into captivity and uh, we must warn people, warn the people in our nation, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm in God's holy mountain. Let them know that there is a God we are accountable for. We can't just do our own thing. We just can't uh, 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 live the way we want to live and ignore God and his precepts and his word and his instruction. And we can't live... Uh, uh, turning our backs to the one who created us. He created us, every one of us, for a purpose. And when you get a nation who turns their back on the Lord, that nation is heading for destruction. The Bible says, blessed is that nation whose God is the Lord. And so as we study the Bible and study 
God's word, we see nations rising, nations falling. We see people rising, people falling. But they that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved. And so we must tell people and warn them <coughs> that there is judgment coming, and, and God is going to judge sin. God hates sin. He does not hate people. He hates sin. He will have to judge sin no matter who you are, no matter where you were born or who you were born to. If you're sinning, he will judge the sin. That is why God has given us in his word the opportunity to be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Even the backslider <coughs> can get slaved. Saved. Saved, not slave. Yes, the backslider can get slaved too, enslaved in sin. But God will save the backslider. Ladies and gentlemen, this false doctrine that is taught uh, by many Christians, once saved, always saved, oh no, oh no. God is not a man that he should lie. And God is not one to be mocked or made uh, uh, fun of or we're not to blaspheme God. We're not to do whatever we want to do and say we're Christians and, and we're, we're safe because we're Christians. No, God has standards. And he said holiness without which no man shall see God. So as we read uh, and study the Bible, we learn a lot. We learn about God's principles, his standards, his love for us, his sacrifice for us, and his sacrifice of his only son, only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, so that you and I might have eternal life. And even the backslider can repent and be restored. Even those who are unsaved can be saved by confessing Jesus Christ as Lord. And so we must continue to warn people. Tell them, don't be stubborn. Don't be proud. Pride goes before the fall. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and be saved and obey him. And we see in uh, the history of the Jewish people, their punishment, we see their sin, their uh, punishment, their captivity, and we see the southern kingdom of Judah, uh, those Jews be returning from Babylon, from 70 years of captivity in Babylon. Those who were carried away by Assyria in the northern kingdom in 721, they never came back to Israel. Their descendants never came back to Israel. And so we see God in his mercy bringing back a remnant, a remnant, just a, a minority of the people who were captured. He brings back a, rem, a remnant 70 years later. There are some people in this return who outlive the entire captivity. And um, there were some of the older ones who were able to outlive uh, the entire captivity and return to Israel. And so we see um, in the first wave of Jews, we see Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. He's the leader of the Jews. And he comes back to build the temple, to rebuild the temple. The temple had been destroyed. Zerubbabel's job was to rebuild the temple. He was appointed by the Persian government. The Persians had overtaken the Babylonians and the Persians under King Cyrus. King Cyrus, the son or grandson of Queen Esther, issued the decree for them to return uh, to, to uh, Israel. And so we see Zerubbabel leading that first wave, and the second wave is led by Ezra. And so we see Zerubbabel and Ezra, and then later the third wave of captives leaving Babylon, led by Nehemiah. <coughs> Chapter 1, we're going to look at Nehemiah's burden. He had a burden. Chapter 2, Nehemiah in Jerusalem, and he... Um, he scouts out the place and gets a good glimpse of what's, what, what the destruction looks like. 
And we see in chapter 2 where he says to the leaders, you see the distress that we are in. Chapter 3, we look at the work began, the work beginning, and the work assignments, how Nehemiah organized the people for the work. Chapter 4, we see opposition to the work. We see Sanballat, who leads the opposition. They had some characters who did not want to see Israel succeed. Sanballat, Tobiah, Gisham, and Om. Then in chapter 4, we see Nehemiah's prayer. There are nine prayers recorded in the book of Nehemiah. And we can learn a lot. We learn a lot about leadership. And I learn a lot about successful leadership by observing the character of Nehemiah as he prayed. We see defending the builders, how they had to defend themselves even as they worked. Chapter 5, we look at internal strife. Ladies and gentlemen, the enemy's not always on the outside. The enemy could be right in your household. Internal strife among the Jews. Chapter 6, we're looking at more trickery from the enemy. The enemy is full of tricks. Satan is wily, W-I-L-E-Y. He's wily. He's full of tricks. Chapter 7, uh, registered by genealogy. Here again, we see the importance of genealogical records. Chapter 8, the people assemble, and Ezra reads the law. Can you imagine uh, after 70 years of captivity, the Jewish people assemble together for the first time, and they hear the word of God being read to them by Ezra. Chapter 9, fasting and prayer, worship and praise, and the declaration, Thou art the Lord, and we see some of God's mighty acts in chapter 9. Chapter 10, we're looking at the covenant renewed and the first fruits promised. Chapter 11, we see there are city assignments and priestly assignments. And we also see that there were not enough people uh, among them to inhabit the city of Jerusalem. So they had to draw uh, names by lot and assign people to bring their families into Jerusalem and live within the city walls. Chapter 12, we see more priestly assignments, uh, priests and singers and their assignments. We see the dedication of the wall. Chapter 12, they had high, a high praise time. The dedication of the wall, and, 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 and God helped them to complete the wall. In 52 days, they rebuilt the wall. In 52 days, despite opposition. And then we see also in chapter 12, thanks unto the Lord. Then in the 13th chapter, the final chapter of Nehemiah, we see Tobiah's goods are cast out. Sanballat and Tobiah, you know, they had, a, they, had, they had their knees on the throats of the Jewish people. Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem and On and the people who lived there these thugs had their knees on their throats. And by the time Nehemiah came by, Nehemiah saw what was happening. And Nehemiah went into action. And we see what happened to Tobiah, one of the leaders, in chapter 13. God does not forget, ladies and gentlemen. God is a God of justice. He will bring justice. And then we see the keeping of the Sabbath and the cleansing completed. What a powerful book, 13 chapters of power. We're going to ask uh, co-pastor Lisa Johnson if she will lead us in prayer tonight. Amen. Father, we just thank you and praise you for this time, Lord God, of learning, God. 
You said, Lord God, let those that have lack wisdom, let them ask. And we thank you, Lord, that you're giving us wisdom and understanding. Because without understanding, without wisdom, with, with wisdom and without understanding, Lord God, we don't understand what your word is saying. But we thanks be to God, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, that you're doing just what you said. Lord God, let us seek deep, deep, deep down in our soul, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Bless our teacher, anoint him with fresh oil, him and his wife, God, in Jesus' name. Bless, 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 in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Co-Pastor Lisa. And we thank all of you uh, for um, being on. We welcome Dustina. We welcome so many others. And thank God for you. Praise God. Now we're looking at Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Um, what a mighty man of God. Chapter 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And so one of his brothers, Hanani, was uh, Nehemiah's brother. And Hanani had escaped from uh, um, Jerusalem, and, and, and he came to, to Persia and saw his brother, Nehemiah, met him in the palace to, uh, to give him a report of what's going on back home in Jerusalem. Verse 3, And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept, and mourned certain days, and fasted, and prayed before the God of heaven. So Nehemiah gets this report from his brother about what the conditions were like. Nehemiah was a captive in Babylon. He heard the conditions of the people who were, had remained in Jerusalem. And uh, it was not a good report. Um, and uh, the walls were torn down. The remnant uh, who, who lived in, in, in Jerusalem, they were they're afflicted. They're under great reproach. And the gates of the city are burned down. And uh, later, Nehemiah learns they, they have no protection. And the, the thugs, the, 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 the uh, enemy, the adversary, the, the, the surrounding tribes, the non-Jews would, would raid them, raping the women, pillaging and destroying. And some of these who were leading this opposition against the Jews were men like Sanballat, Geshem, Tobiah, and On. And so Nehemiah says in verse 4, It came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, this kind of fasting and mourning touches the heart of God. You can be a Nehemiah. You can be an Esther. You can be an Ezra. You can be a Paul. You can be a David. No matter what your situation, when you see a situation, it could be your, your mourning for this government, mourning for this nation, mourning for the church, mourning for the family, mourning for the, about the destruction of people. God entertains this kind of mourning. This kind of mourning and fasting gets his ear. And so Nehemiah, even though, ladies and gentlemen, there's something you need to know about uh, Persia and Babylon, every king had a cup bearer. That's the person who tasted the king's food before the king ate the food or drank the wine. In other words, the cup bearer was the, the go-to man, the setup person. If someone was trying to poison the king, the cup bearer would die first. If someone was trying to poison the king with some poison or some wine, the cup bearer would die first. Nehemiah's job was the cupbearer, one of the most important positions in the kingdom. And notice, the cupbearer was not a Persian 
or a Babylonian. The cupbearer was a Jew, one of the captives. Also, in studying uh, Babylonian history, we discover that the cupbearer had a very, not only a very important responsibility, uh, but the cupbearer had to make sure that his countenance pleased the king. What do you mean, Pastor Carter? In other words, the cupbearer could not be looking haggard, worn, weary, distraught, frustrated, beat up, beat down. The cupbearer had to always present himself very presentable to the king. The cupbearer's countenance, the cupbearer's face uh, had to please the king. If not, ladies and gentlemen, if the cupbearer's countenance did not please the king, the king could have the cupbearer executed on the spot. And so uh, and I'm saying this because a lot, of you had jo a lot of you have jobs, and your jobs get you down, and, and life gets you down, and you get worn, weary, and worn, and, 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 and uh, uh, a lot of you have assignments, and, and you're not always happy and pleased about your assignments, and a lot of you are in circumstances. Well, let's say us. A lot of us, we're in circumstances where we can't always smile and present ourselves, and and imagine if if every time you frowned, or you, you didn't look happy, or, or 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 the joy was not being expressed on your face, you could be zapped, you could be executed. Well, that's the kind of life Nehemiah lived as the cupbearer. So he said, I mourned and I fasted and I prayed, and and. He more, even while he mourned and fasted and prayed, he had to watch himself. And so, verse 5, and he said, here's one of his prayers, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel. Listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. This is what got God's attention. A sincere man of God humbling himself before God. But look what he says in the rest of this verse, verse 6, which we have sinned against thee, Let's go back. And confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. When Nehemiah heard from his brother Hanani what it was happening in Jerusalem, and Nehemiah could have been comfortable in the palace, just like when, and when we see Esther next week, Esther was comfortable in the palace. But her cousin Mordecai lets her know, hey, hey, uh, you're comfortable right here, but, but uh, our people are about to be slaughtered all over the world. Well, we'll wait the next week to tell that story. But Nehemiah could have been comfortable and not worry about, well, hey, it's on them. It's on them, you know. I got me a good job. And there are a lot of people who who say, I got me a good job, everything's cool, calm, and copacetic here. Uh, ain't, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm riding the crest of the wave. And, 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 and no compassion, no compassion for people, no compassion. And, and, and we see this among our leadership today, no compassion for the hurting people, no compassion. And so Nehemiah was a man of great compassion. He fasted and he prayed and he, 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 uh, felt the pain of the people and and he took this to God and when you uh, my brothers and my sisters and when I when we go to God like this oh God I hurt for so and so I'm hurting for so and so uh, oh God I feel the burden for so and so or I feel the burden for this nation or I feel the burden for the people then Nehemiah said God it's we're in this condition. In other words, he identified. Here's a leader, ladies and gentlemen, who identified with the problems of the people. Nehemiah said, God, it's because of my sins and the sins of our fathers 
and the sins of the people. We have sinned against you, Lord God. That is why this destruction has come upon us. Ladies and gentlemen, when Americans, even people in international communities, look at this coronavirus, which ain't going away, and, and despite, despite uh, uh, what governor says you can start up again or what uh, uh, mayor says you can start up again, the numbers are still going up. And, 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 and uh, Karen's back to work as a nurse because the numbers are still going up. When, when we identify these situations, and, and it's going to take men and women of God who will humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. Many of us have to fast and pray on the behalf of others. And Nehemiah identified with others. Even though he had a comfortable position, ladies and gentlemen, we've got many people in, in the body of Christ who are comfortable in their position. They are at ease in Zion. But Nehemiah teaches us about compassion and being able to identify with people who are hurting. And then, and then he was not so proud uh, uh, that he couldn't say, Lord, we're in this situation because of my sins and, and the people's sins and the sins of our fathers. We have sinned against you. When we take a look at this coronavirus thing, when we take a look at what's happening in the nation and the nations, when we take a look at, at this police brutality, when we take a look at the hatred and the resentment and the bitterness, we've got to come before God and say, God, it's because of my sins, our sins the sins of our fathers. And, and, and the sins of our fathers means that these things that uh, brought us to this place have been going on for centuries, for hundreds of years. When America wakes up and is able to face that and take a look in the mirror and, 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 and look and see, and see how ugly we are in God's sight and, and that God is not pleased with the way we've been treating one another, with the way we've, we've, we've been treating him. And when we repent, not only America but the nations, God said, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. And after Nehemiah prayed his prayer, what a powerful prayer in chapter 1. He got the attention of the king. He uh, received the attention of the king. And chapter 2, uh, it, and it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes was the king 20 years into his kingdom that wine was before him. And I took up the wine. In other words, I had to taste the wine and gave it unto the king. Now, I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. He was sore afraid because he could have been killed because his countenance did not please the king. The king said, why are you looking so bad? Why are you looking so rough, so haggard? Why are you looking so beat up? And that, that could have been a death sentence for Nehemiah. But see, Nehemiah fasted and prayed, ladies and gentlemen. And fasting and prayer touches the heart of God. Fasting and prayer touches the heart of God. And, the, and said unto the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? What are you asking me? And so, and, and so what, what, what are you asking me to do? And so Nehemiah, before he answered the king, he prayed again. He said, So I prayed to the God of heaven. Verse 5, and I said unto the king, if it please the king. See how God gave him favor? God got Nehemiah's attention through his brother Hanani. God got the king's attention through uh, Nehemiah fasting and praying. And then the king said, what would you want me to do? 
And then Nehemiah prayed again and sought God. When we seek God for wisdom, God, what shall I do? And wisdom is what shall I do? Uh, and God will reveal what we shall do. Okay, and the king said unto me, with the queen sitting by him, for how long shall thy journey be? And so the answer was, uh, Nehemiah asked the king, can you send me to Jerusalem? Can you send me to Jerusalem? I've got to help my brothers and my sisters. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the kind of prayer that touches God. For Second Chronicles 16.9 tells us, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking to prove himself strong on the behalf of those whose hearts are perfect toward, the, toward him. God's eyes are running, ladies and gentlemen, throughout the whole earth. He's up in Fleetwood, Pennsylvania. He's in Marysville, Ryan. He's on the turnpike with you. He's in Wilmington, Delaware, Loretta. He's in uh, um, Tennessee, uh, Dustina. He's in Texas, uh, Shebra. He's in California. He's down here in Georgia. That's only in just America. He's, his eyes are running all across the nations. The nations. He's looking for someone whose heart is turned to God, who wants to do something about the situations of people, people's lives. God is seeking for a man or woman, even a child, who, whom God can lead to change, to bring change upon the earth. Jesus taught us, he said, and when you pray, pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God is looking for men and women, boys and girls. You don't have to be born into a royal family. You don't have to be rich and well-to-do. He is looking for somebody who can touch the world. He's looking for somebody, somebody like George Floyd. George Floyd said in, in school, he told his friends, I want to touch the world. And who was George Floyd? They said he was from the third ward in Houston, Texas. Uh, poor, poor, uh, from a poor family. Had very little to contribute. He could play basketball, football. But God will use an ordinary person to touch the world and change the world. When, when a heart is turned unto God, God seeking, his eyes are looking right now. We've got a lot of people in the kingdom of God, they're comfortable. Pastors comfortable in their churches. People got nice jobs, got nice homes, got paycheck, got some nice retirement income coming in. Most people are comfortable and don't want to make the way. I ain't going. I ain't going to sacrifice what I got. Took me a long time to get where I am now, and and this and that. But God is looking for somebody who's got a heart for God who wants to bring the things of the kingdom of God into the earth. And Jesus said, when you pray, pray after this manner, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let your kingdom come. And, 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 and Isaiah, when we study Isaiah, you're going to see a man of God who, who looked at the situation and said, oh, wicked man that I am, oh, wretched soul that I am. And, 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 and God says, well, who can I send? Who can I send to, to change this situation in Israel? Who can I send to awaken the people? Who can I send to call the people back to me? Who can I send who will be bold enough and courageous enough to preach my word in the face of adversity and to call the people's attention back to me? And Isaiah said, here am I, Lord. Send me. Here am I. Send me. I'm willing. And ladies and gentlemen, God is looking for someone who is willing. He is willing. And, and, and when he finds someone who is willing, he will convict. And he will provide everything that that person needs to do the assignment that God has said do. And I love Ryan. Ryan's one of our scouts. Yes, he's a scout, Lisa. 
Ryan's out scouting for land so we can build a retreat area for pastors because there are so many pastors hurting. Pastors are dying. Pastors are committing suicide. There are pastors uh, throughout this nation and the world. They are committing suicide. The suicide rate for pastors is up. Uh, houses, households breaking up. Divorce rate uh, escalating. And, and pastors who don't know what to do, they can't handle the problems, the burdens. And most pastors are under the psyche that uh, I can change things. And when they can't change things and realize uh, things are getting worse. Many pastors go off the deep end. Most pastors cannot sleep. Most pastors have uh, a sleep apnea. Uh, even CPAP machines won't help them. And 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 uh, many pastors they have tremors at night and terroristic dreams and and this. And, and, and how can I lead the people? And many pastors get up in front of people on Sunday mornings, and they put on a good show. They put on a good act. Their countenance looks good, but they're hurting. They're, there's a storm going on on the inside. So God says, I want you to build a retreat area for pastors. And God said, let it be in Pennsylvania. God said, I want it to be in Pennsylvania. There are other lands. I've got a friend up in New York. She has about 100 acres. She said, we'll sell you some of our land. No, God said Pennsylvania. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Gene said, well, I, I, there's some in Maryland. No, God said Pennsylvania. God has his place. And so, but God is looking for someone who's willing to say, okay. And so we've got Ryan out there. Pray for Ryan that as, as he scouts out the land that he'll be our eyes and our ears and let the Lord speak to him and reveal to him and praise God. And, and, and then when, when we get the land, let us work together. Let's build a place where pastors can come and get healing, ladies and gentlemen. Let's build a place where, well, we can, where, where God's anointing will be on that land from the very time. I'm believing at the very time pastors' feet touch the ground, that they're healed, ladies and gentlemen, that they're delivered. And Dr. Gene says, well, I want a cabin on the ground. I want to live there all year round. Hey, me too, Dr. Gene. <laughs> Praise God. I want, I want a place where God's presence can be so powerful that, that uh, people who are sick can touch that ground and be healed and that the anointing of the Lord will be upon them. This is the kind of burden that God has put in a person's heart. He put this burden in Nehemiah's heart. He put this burden in Ezra's heart. He put this kind of burden in... In, in, in Esther's heart. And, and, and God is just looking. He's looking. And, and he has all the power of heaven to support you in your work. Pastor, Lee, Pastor Larry Johnson and Pastor Lisa Johnson in Coastville, they know God will use all his power to bring about the vision. Uh, Loretta, God will use all his power. Karen, God will use all his power. Alan Noel, God will use all his power. God will make sure that what he's given you, Dustina, he will bring it forth as you trust in him. But as you see in the study of Nehemiah, there will be opposition. There will be opposition. And so the king uh, proclaimed that Nehemiah should go back to Jerusalem, and he asked Nehemiah, how long do you, do you I think you'll be there? And Nehemiah told him, as answer his first trip, he, he, did, he made two trips to Jerusalem. The first trip was for 12 years. The first assignment was for 12 years. And then he went back to Babylon or Persia, and then the king released him again on a second tour. And so uh, the king authorized, he authorized Nehemiah um, to be the governor, the governor of Jerusalem. He designated him as governor with letters from the king of Persia. That meant that nobody, nobody, no king, no army could, could, could hurt or harm Nehemiah. And anywhere Nehemiah would go and ask for supplies or lumber or building materials or, or money, that the people would give it to uh, Nehemiah, as though they were get, giving it to the king of Persia who controlled all that land. Chapter 2, verse 11. 
Now, when God gives you a plan, ladies and gentlemen, you can't tell everybody about it. There are a lot, a lot of pastors I ain't telling them right now what I'm doing. I'll tell them after it's done. Because there, there are a lot of people in the body of Christ. You can't even tell them your plans. There are people in your household. You can't even tell them all your plans. Because, you know, the moment they hear your plans, you know what they're going to say. Well, here we go, Pastor Carter. Here we go. Oh, here we go. Uh, a, hus- a wife may say, I don't know what my husband is up to this time. I don't know what my wife wants to do this time. I don't know. We tried that before. And you tell your congregation, nah, well, we tried that 20 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, some of your plans, you got to just let them simmer. Just like that pot of greens that I fixed, Dusty, and that pot of collard greens that I fixed a jacket yesterday. Got to let it simmer, baby. You got to let it simmer. You know, just let it slow cook on simmer for a while. And let that flavor, let that flavor, flavor. You, 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 you'll hear that flavor knocking on the inside of the walls of that pot. Eat me, eat me, eat me, eat me. You, you know, you know when you've let it simmer. And same thing with your faith vision, ladies and gentlemen. There, sometimes you got to sit on it, pray, pray about it, pray, pray, talk, talk to God like Habakkuk talked on the wall. Habakkuk said, "I'm going to stand on my guard post." I'm going to situate myself on the rampart. I'm going to watch and see what he will say to me when I'm reproved. You've got to have a Habakkuk attitude. Wait on the Lord. Let that vision simmer. And, 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 and God spoke to him and said, Though the vision tarry, wait for it. Though the vision tarry, wait for it. Ryan, though the vision tarry, wait for it. Wait for it. You might have to make a couple trips. Uh, but though the vision tarry, you wait for it. And then that, let that vision be like a pot of collard greens, Dustina, and, and, and let those greens simmer. You might have to add a little bit more water to that pot of greens. Just let it simmer. Let that flavor, uh, uh, that flavor, uh, flavor and start shaking hands and high fi and, 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 and fist pumping itself inside that pot of greens. And then you, you hear that flavor beating on the side of the pot of the pan while it's simmering. And you hear that uh, uh, those greens talking to you, those collard greens are start talking to you. Hey, come on, when are you going to eat me? Come on now, hey, come on now. Don't overcook me. I'm ready. I'm ready. Well, that's the way it is, ladies and gentlemen. When we go before the Lord, when we fast and pray, God, I'm ready. God, I'm ready. And then God might not be ready. There's a timing. God's got his timing about everything. God's got his timing. You might be ready. But you might be ready in your own power, your own enthusiasm, your own joy. But wait on the Lord. I think I'm preaching to somebody. I think I'm helping somebody. I think I'm helping myself. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. He shall strengthen thine heart. And so Nehemiah came to Jerusalem. He observed. He looked at the situation. Verse 12 of chapter 2. And I arose in the night. I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me, save the beast I rode upon. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went up to the gate of the fountain, and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the brook, and viewed the wall, and turned back, and entered by the gate of the valley, and so returned. And the rulers knew not whither I went, or what I did, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. Verse 17 of chapter 2, ladies and gentlemen. Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, and let us build up the walls of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Ladies and gentlemen, as I read this scripture, I'm, taking a, I'm getting a panoramic view of America. There might be a time, ladies and gentlemen, it might be your grandchild or your great-grandchild or your great-great-grandchild 
who might have to rally people in Philadelphia, who might have to rally people in Chattanooga, who might have to rally people in Atlanta, who might have to rally people in Chicago or L.A. and say, you see the reproach that we're in. We're in this condition because of our sins, of the sins of our fathers, of the sins of, of the nation. We are people. We disobeyed God, and this is what we have. Ladies and gentlemen, I know you might think I'm off my cookie, but it might well be that your great-grandchild, your great great grandchild, your great, great, great grandchild might even be your child who will have to rally people and say, look at the destruction that has taken this place. Nobody imagined that we would ever experience this kind of rubble and destruction. This is the United States of America. But ladies and gentlemen, if my people, God said, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin. I will heal the land. Ladies and gentlemen, Nehemiah prayed one of those heal the land prayers, and he gathered people with him to identify with the fact that the land needed healing. Not only did the people need healing, but the land needed healing. Ladies and gentlemen, sin, sin even, listen to this, sin even penetrates the ground. Sin even penetrates the ground. Ground, land, land masses, acres of land, territories need healing, need deliverance from sin. That's something to think about. That is why every time you move into a new place or you build a house or you relocate, pray, pray, pray. Ask God, put your anointing on this property. Put your anointing on this house. Put your anointing on this job. I don't know what the person who had this job before me did. I don't know what the person who lived in this building before me did. I don't know what the person who owned this car that I just got uh, did. So, Lord, deliver it from sin. Deliver it. Satan is territorial, ladies and gentlemen. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, ruler spirits, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. I was talking to Jackie today. I said, Jackie, the Civil War was not enough for America to cause America to repent. There are folks in America who still think they're better than others. There are folks who are still hating on one another. There are folks who still uh, 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 raise that Confederate flag above the United States of America. There are leaders who still have not gotten the message. The land, ladies and gentlemen, needs to be delivered. So not only the people, but the land. Satan is entrenched. Satan is territorial. Hatred and, 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 and resentment and bitterness, ladies and gentlemen, it permeates this land that we live upon, the United States of America. It is deeply entrenched, not only in the hearts of people, but in the land. Certain places are more, uh, 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 Satan's more entrenched in certain places than in others. It's going to take a healing of the land. I was thinking about Abraham Lincoln when I was taking my two-mile walk in the mountains today. And, and I, th I thought about Abraham Lincoln, and he gave the last full measure. He called it the last full measure. He took a bullet to the head from a racist assassin who did not want Lincoln to pull this nation together, who did not want to see slaves free, who did not want to see justice done in America. And we look at many, we look at Lincoln, we look at Garfield, we look at Cleveland, we look at uh, John F. Kennedy, ladies, men who have been assassinated so that they could not pull together the better things that are in God's will and plans for this nation. And so God is looking for people who are going to be bold. Yes, some are going to have to die. Some will have to give the last full measure. But God is looking for people who will be bold enough to take a stand. Why should our great-great-grandchildren have to rebuild out of rubble that we caused to happen because of our racism, our hatred, our dishonoring God, our selfishness, and our pride. I know I'm saying some profound things, and I know I'm tugging at some hearts. 
But until America takes a good look at herself and people take a look in the mirror and stop the hatred, you are no better than anybody else. I'm no better than anybody else. We're all made in God's image. And except a man be born again, we cannot see the kingdom of God. And if you're, if you're born again, you'll stop the hatred. Despite what your pastor is preaching to you. Despite what your community believes. If you're still hating on others, how can you say you're born again? And how in the world do you think you're going to get into heaven with hatred in your heart towards other people? Ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to, well, I, I won't wait to see my great-grandchildren have to rebuild because I won't be here. But I wouldn't want to put that burden on them, that America was destroyed because I was a punk and I, and, and I was too proud to humble myself before God. And, and I hated on people despite what the Bible said. And, and, and I took my position. I said, I'm going to get mine. You get yours. And, 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 and later for this nation, I don't want to be one of those decision makers who have no kindness in my heart. No, no vision for the, the lives of our children and our grandchildren and, and future posterity. And, 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 and we'll, we'll lay the burden on people like Nehemiah because I refuse to honor God and live a holy life. No, 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 no. I, 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 I pray that God will open the eyes of people in leadership in this nation, heads of households, Train your children in the ways of the Lord. Don't let them grow up hating. Be careful what you say to your family. Be careful how you speak to your wife. Be careful how you speak to your children. Be careful how you speak about your neighbor. Be careful how you speak of the, those people of color. Be careful what you say. Don't kill people with your words. Don't ingrain. Don't burn into your children and grandchildren hatred because of your venomous words. But speak the word of God to them. And not only speak of it, live it before them. Live it before them. Well, these are things that Nehemiah wished he could have done 70 years ago, but he was not there. And so in his situation... He's got to try to recover the lives of the people who are the victims of destruction, and destruction came on their nation because of sin. And so Nehemiah gathered the people together and said, You see the distress that we are in. Verse 18, powerful. Chapter 2, Then I told them of the hand of my God which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Nehemiah called them together, called the leaders together, told them, you see the distress we're in. And he helped the people to identify with their fathers and their grandfathers and great-grandfathers and to realize this destruction we're seeing is because of the sins of our ancestors and our own sins. And Nehemiah's uh, 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 declaration touched the heart of the people, and they said, let us rise up and build. Ladies and gentlemen, God oftentimes sends someone to you and say, okay, let us rise up and build. Get up. Get up out of there. Get up out of this situation. Quit that uh, pity me party. Close the doors. The party's over. Time. Rise up. Get up. Because, you know, many Christians, we are so content. You know, we're like uh, uh, the pig that the wallows in her slop. We used to raise pigs when I was growing up in Coastal. We had a couple of pigs, and they loved that slop. I mean, they had a, we had a pig pen, and we all of our garbage and food, used food went into the pig's pen, and the pigs mixed it in, and, 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 and I mean, they just lived in that slop, and they would turn and frolic and roll in the slop, and, and the dog, a dog, will, a dog will eat its own vomit and lay in its own vomit 
and be content there. And, and we see people today, they're laying in their own vomit. They're uh, wallowing in their own slop. And they're just as content, just as happy. But that's not the place God wants us to be. And so the people had to hear the word of God and come to the conviction, let us rise up like the, the prodigal son. I see him. I see the prodigal son. He said, my father's servants are living much better than I. I'm going to get up out of here. I'm, I know I've created this mess. I know I brought it on my own self, but I ain't going to stay here. He had to come to a quality decision, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to rise up. I'm going back to my father's house. I'm going to offer myself to my father as a hired servant, but I ain't going to stay here. Ladies and gentlemen, it takes an I ain't going to stay here attitude to bring change. It's going to take an, an I ain't going to stay here attitude for people in America come November to go to the polls and say, uh, this this has got to change. This has got to change. It's going to take an I ain't going to stay here attitude throughout the whole world as we see nations on the move for change over, over the choking of one black man. That eight minutes and 46 seconds of that cop's knee on that man's throat touched the world. George Floyd said to his friends when he's grown up in school, I'm going to touch the world. He had no idea he'd touch it that way. He felt he was going to touch it by being a better basketball player than Michael Jordan. But no, God had another way for him to touch the world. And Nehemiah, Nehemiah is still, ladies and gentlemen, the faith of Nehemiah is still touching the world today. Every time I read Nehemiah, I want to rise up. I want to get up out of this situation. Get up out of this situation and, and, and do better. We can do better. We can do better. We can do better. We can help others <coughs> to do better. Well, they're going to hate on you, Pastor Carter. That's all right. You hate on me. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. We can do better. And so we see Sanballat and the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian. When they heard the declaration of the people to rise up and strengthen themselves for the work, these men laughed. Nehemiah said, they laughed us to scorn. What is this that you will do? Will you rebel against the king? And so then we see these thugs sending letters to the king of Persia saying, you know, this guy, Nehemiah, you sent here, uh, he's not going to be faithful to you. He's already set himself up to be king, and, and, and he's got all these people uh, 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 obeying him and doing this, but his intention is not to build a wall around Jerusalem. His intention is to rebel against you. And that's the kind of letter they sent back to the king of Persia. And so the king of Persia had to recall Nehemiah from the work. Nehemiah had to go back to Persia. And see, whenever, ladies and gentlemen, you make up your mind, you're going to do this. You're going to obey God. You can expect trouble to come. That's why I, I preach and, and I learned this from uh, Marilyn Hickey 30 years ago. Every faith vision has three stages. You've got the birth of the vision. Everybody's happy. You mentioned we're going to build a, a retreat area for pastors. Dr. Gene Bratton says, yay, let's do it. I even want my own cabin on that land. She's going to have her own cabin. You watch. And then there comes the death of the vision where trouble comes. I ain't selling you any land, as a certain relative says. I'm, I ain't ready. I ain't ready. Now look here, ladies and gentlemen. She's had a couple of strokes. She's not in good health. We want to offer some money so she could at least enjoy the money. No, no. Did you pray about it? I, I got down on my knees. I ain't asked you if you got down on your knees. I said, did you pray about it? Well, look, I, 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 I'm not even going to think about it anymore until after this coronavirus thing is over. 
uh, about another year. Contact me about another year. That's a relative talking to me, ladies and gentlemen. That's death of a vision. But then when you wake up one morning and God says, go get your land. <laughs> go get your land. Send your scout out. Send your main scout out. Call Ryan. Call Ryan. Make sure the land is near airport. So, so, so Jack and I have to come back to Georgia. We're near airport. We can fly back to Georgia. Okay? We got family here. Uh, send the scout out. So that's called, ladies and gentlemen, that's called the re resurrection of the vision. Resurrection, and, and, and no matter what God has told you to do, when trouble comes, you endure it. You endure it. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Greater is he in you than he that's in the world. And you've got to tell yourself that. Speak the word of God. Put God's word on it. Put God's word on the situation. Put God's word on Ryan when he in terror go to look at the land. Put God's word on Gene Bratton's cabin on that land. Put God's word on pastors when their feet touch the, the ground, they're healed. Put God's word on the fact that there will be a place where they can get some rest for the first time in decades. A pastor can sleep all night long. Praise God. Amen. Put God's word on your faith vision. Put God's word on helping your neighbor with his or her faith vision. Put God's word on the church rising up and being what God has called us to do. And there will be Sanballats and Geshems and Ons who will come into our lives to try to stop the work. They will lie. They will deceive. They will discredit your reputation. As we see happening in our nation today, people's reputations being discredited. They will even send out fake news. Fake news. Well, you know, he's only trying to build up Jerusalem because he wants to declare himself king and break away from you, king of Persia. Fake news. They will send out tweets. Fake news. But you be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So chapter 5 Nehemiah had to deal with internal strife within the Jews. Okay? Uh, there were certain Jews charging them high interest rates. There are certain Jews who, who owned the people economically and, and had their knees on the throats of the people, choking them to death financially. Uh, the crops that they were growing, the people were not able to eat their own crops. They owed it to their, 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 uh, the people they were sharing the crops with. And, and internal uh, suppression from their own people. And Nehemiah had to put an end to that. He cleaned house, ladies and gentlemen. And there are times when you've got to stand up and clean house. Chapter 6, we see Sanballat, Tobiah, Gisham, and the rest of their enemies and, and they try to set Nehemiah up to assassinate him. Oh, come together. Come with us, verse 2 of chapter 6. Let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. Let's celebrate. Let's talk. Let's, let's have a conversation. Let's have a little banquet. Because you're somebody, uh, uh, Nehemiah. We want to celebrate you. In the plain of Oh No, just the name of it gave uh, Nehemiah the answer. Oh no, he said they thought to do me mischief, and I sent messengers unto them saying, "Listen to this, ladies and gentlemen, and this is what the message you sent out to the world around you. I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you?" Ladies and gentlemen, Satan wants to pull you down. You're doing a great work. You're building a strong marriage. You're building a strong household. Don't come down from your marriage to use some drugs or to have sex with somebody outside your marriage or to fall for that lure of money. No, I'm about a great work. I cannot come down. Stay on the wall, ladies and gentlemen. 
stay on the wall. And so even as the opposition uh, came upon them, Nehemiah had to be wise. And in chapter 10, they invited him to meet us in the temple. Now see, now this is when the religious demons come against you. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, rulers of the darkness of this world. Now the religious demons try to take over. Verse 10, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple. For they will come to slay you, but you come and let's shut you, shut you up in the temple. And we'll protect you. Ladies and gentlemen, you've got to be careful. You can't go on fellowship with uh, Brother Doodad or Bishop so-and-so because if their hearts are not right and they see you doing a great work, they're going to try to subdue your work and get the glory for themselves and by trickery. So they're jealous folks out there. They don't want you to have a successful marriage. They don't want you to have a happy family. There are people who, even with this coronavirus, they don't want to see people healed. There are people trying to get over financially on others through hook and crook. And so you've got to be alert. You've got to be wise. I've got to be wise, like Nehemiah. Nine times in this book, 13 chapters, nine times he prayed unto the Lord. Verse 14, My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat according to these their works, and on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets, that they would have put me in fear. And you've got to be careful of all these so-called prophets, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody calling himself a prophet is not a prophet of God. Everybody calling herself a prophetess is not a prophet, prophetess of God. You've got spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And if you're not careful, ladies and gentlemen, they will subdue you. Ladies and gentlemen, don't, don't, don't fellowship with witches. Don't fellowship with uh, unclean spirits. And be careful of all these folks who label themselves prophets and apostles and bishops. Everybody got a title, but nobody has any Jesus power. You be alert. Stay woke. Stay alert. Get on the wall. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Be like Nehemiah. Be like Habakkuk. Wait on your guard post. And watch and see what God will say to you. I don't run here because the bishop says run. I almost got caught up in that situation. The bishop said, you go here and go there. Now, the bishop messed up. The bishop messed up. First assignment he gave me, he messed up. And God told me, no, this is not what I want you to do. No, you take your assignment from me. Okay, a lot of folks are locked up in these fruitless ministries because they worship the bishop. They kiss up to the bishop. I ain't kissing up to any bishop. I don't care who you are. I ain't kissing up to you. I owe my allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm going to wait to hear his voice Gene Braddon, I'm going to wait to hear his voice. I want him to tell me what to do. And if I get sidetracked, I'm going to repent and go back to him. Lord, get me back on track. I want to do the will of God and not please people. Ladies and gentlemen, we got a whole lot of people pleasers in Washington, D.C. Hire them on Monday and fire them on Saturday. Hire them on Monday and have a press conference and present them as your new uh, uh, officer or czar or whatever and fire them three days later. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to hear from the Lord because true promotion comes from the Lord. Okay, going through Nehemiah, um, we see the people assemble. We see the importance of, reg of the genealogy, chapter 7 that the genealogical record is so important. It's so important, ladies and gentlemen. And the very fact that Jeremiah, before the, the uh, exile, Jeremiah bought a, per, a piece of property and sealed it, sealed the deed, and, and that deed was uh, very important because Jeremiah's family was able to benefit from the genealogical record when uh, uh, Jeremiah's people returned from um, Babylon. 
so the genealog genealogical record was important to make sure that God's people received the inheritance and not those who were wannabes or, or phonies or, or false Jews, fake Jews. Many people were trying to fake it, fake their Jewish genealogy to get in on the property distribution. Chapter 8, the people assemble and Ezra reads the law for the first time, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time in 70 years, the people heard the word of God. Ezra, uh, Ezra found a scroll and Nehemiah and Ezra um, and, and the leaders, they built a pulpit. A raised ele elevation. That's where we first got the pulpits. They built a pulpit and all the people in Jerusalem gathered. And for days, several days, they read the word of God. They read the word of God. And the people praised God and they worshiped. They repented. They cried. And they worshiped God. Chapter 9, there was fasting and prayer, worship and praise. And the people declared, Thou art the Lord. We see God's mighty acts take place. They renewed the covenant in chapter 10. And then, because they had to populate that city, the walls were built. So we built the walls. We, and they built the walls in 50, the wall in 52 days. Now they had to repopulate Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah chose the people to populate Jerusalem by lot. Certain people, there, they were given, they drew lots to see what families would move into Jerusalem and populate the place. And um, they were given special privileges. And then other people were able to uh, inhabit the land surrounding Jerusalem. Then chapter 11, we see city assignments and Certain people were assigned to live in certain cities. We see priestly assignments. I mean, they just regenerated the whole priestly thing. And they got back to where the priests were like during the time of Aaron and Eleazar and Phineas, <clears throat> where the priests feared the Lord. And so the priests received their assignments. And then the priests and the singers, the sons of Asaph, they worshiped God and taught the people how to worship God. Priests were given the assignments to go to different cities and share the word of God and to get the people back on target with the word of God. I mean, that they had to retrain, re-educate Israel. Chapter 12, we see the dedication of the wall. What a celebration when they dedicated the wall and thanked God, gave thanks unto God. And then chapter 13, here's how Nehemiah dealt with that political corruption that had allowed itself to creep into Jerusalem over the last 70 years. And and, and that corruption that had been a part of the destruction of Jerusalem before the carrying away into captivity. The politicians had such a rule over God's priest. And we see this in the case of Tobiah in chapter 13. Tobiah, I mean, Tobiah was so, uh, uh, he was a, the, I think the son-in-law of Sanballat, one of the major enemies of the Jews. Tobiah had property within the temple. They built him a house within the temple complex. It's, 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 like, it's like you build Senator so-and-so a, a suite in your church, and Senator so-and-so can come and go as he pleases, and whatever Senator so-and-so says, that's what we do. And there are churches under the knees of politicians. There are a lot of politicians have their knees on the throats of a lot of pastors. And a lot of ministries are subject to the political whims of the political leaders. And so 
what Nehemiah did when he saw this, it grieved him. And he knew the character of Tobiah and Sambalot and the people he hung out with. And, and, and Nehemiah said, oh, no, oh, no, not in the house of God. You have an apartment in the house of God? And the, all these offerings we've been given, setting aside for the priests, and the tithes and offerings have been going to you? <laughs> Nehemiah cleaned house, ladies and gentlemen. He cleaned house. He cleaned house. And ladies and gentlemen, a lot of God's tithes and offerings are going to these po po politicians. Mm-hmm. Better wake up. Be alert. Be alert. And, and ladies and gentlemen, and, and these politicians have certain prophets and prophetesses, quote, unquote, in their pockets. One very well-known prophet prophetess in America had a vision this last week she saw the president and Jesus Christ both riding on a white horse in the clouds the two of them riding on a white horse in the clouds ladies and gentlemen be very careful who you listen to be very careful who you call a prophet apostle a bishop a pastor, a preacher. Be very careful who you call a Christian. I ain't making Christians out of anybody who ain't saved. Be very careful the visions you entertain and the interpretations of these visions. Ladies and gentlemen, you test the spirit by the spirit. Nehemiah was a spirit tester. Nehemiah knew that Tobiah was no good. A corrupt, crooked politician had a suite built for him in the temple of God. And, and his furnishings were provided by the people of God and the tithe that should have gone to the priests. The priests weren't getting their tithes. The priests had to go out and work the fields to earn a living. But Tobiah and Sanballat and these crooked politicians were controlling the temple. They had the priests in their pocket. And Nehemiah said, oh, no, Nehemiah cleaned house, ladies and gentlemen. And we see the end of Old Testament history with the book of Nehemiah. We're going to look at Esther next week and Esther Esther takes place before the conclusion of Nehemiah. We'll lock her in next week. But uh, Old Testament history comes to an end with the book of Nehemiah. And we're looking at around, around about the year 403 B.C. There's a great revival in Israel. But then we know from the fact that there's a 400 period 400 year period of quiet that the Jews backslid and that temple that was built by Zerubbabel and dedicated by Nehemiah that temple that temple was destroyed so it's, it's a great and powerful history but we can learn a lot about how we're to live and learn about the God we are to worship, the God who made us, the God who planted us here, has a plan for our lives, and, and how to live with the people whom God has planted around us. So that ends the uh, story of Nehemiah. You read it for yourself, and the Holy Spirit will give you more insights. And um, I just praise God for this book, this Bible. Thank God for this course. Old Testament books of history. Next week, we're going to look at a, another great hero, hero of the Bible, Esther, Queen Esther, and her role in, 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 in God's kingdom. And so we pray that you'll have a, a great week. We're going to end our...
recording in a moment. If you have any questions, please get in touch with me. Any comments, please get in touch with me. Uh, we're going to end the recording. And I thank God. Stay on the wall, everybody. Stay alert. Stay in the Word of God. Stay in prayer. And, and continue to trust in the Lord. God's not through. He's got the plan.